Hi, I'm Christine McIntosh. Um, I'm a GP and also a GP liaison in child health here and also a child health researcher, so a bit of a combination. Um, I'm a researcher because I like to solve problems and um, that's what's always sort of got me into um, the realm of research. So this is about implementing a safe sleep calculator into primary care and this is an avenue of research I haven't been in before, it's sort of more qualitative um, research. Um, but I'd like just like to tell you where we're up to with this study really. So it's about implementing a safe sleep calculator into primary care to really address the risk of SUDI in our community. Um, as I said, this came up as a bit of a, an idea. We in the um, Northern Region SUDI Working Group um, are very keen on uh, making sure we've got consistent messaging throughout our region about SUDI. And we were doing very well with the health workforce in the hospital and the DHBs, but primary care was a bit more um, elusive as to how we're actually going to make sure we get consistent messaging out there. So how are we going to get these messages into primary care and achieve safe sleeping babies and reduce SUDI rates. So that's really, you know, research for me is about problem solving. Um, that's interesting. Oh. Okay, so what did we have? We had Ed Mitchell who had a, an app on his, um, that he had created for smartphones and um, devices that was a SUDI risk calculator. And he demonstrated this at one of the hui that we have for our SUDI research. And I thought, aha, because we had this problem that we needed to solve about how to get primary care to do the right thing for SUDI. And I thought, knowing being a GP and using uh, our patient management system out in, in practice, that um, actually I reckon we could convert this and make this a really good thing to use in primary care. So that was, aha. But actually, you can't just decide to do this in primary care and expect everybody to do it. So you actually need to find out what are going to be the levers, is it going to be the right format, is it the right sort of thing to do. So this built the hypothesis for the study, really, to say, well, will it facilitate a greater understanding of SUDI amongst primary care workers, and would it result in a targeted, informed discussion with families? Is it actually going to achieve what we want it to achieve? Um, which could be measured by a reduction in modifiable risks. So, very important to give a little bit of background here. F number one is SUDI is preventable. We know this because we saw a 60% reduction in uh, what was known as SIDS back then, but it, when we had the COT death study came out with a recommendation for us to sleep our babies not on their tummies and then not on their sides and not on their tummies, so onto their backs. And so we saw a very rapid reduction in the rate of SIDS um, back there in the early 90s. And more recently, with our programs that we have for safe sleep baby beds and consistent messaging, we've seen a really nice reduction in SUDI rate in the northern region and actually throughout New Zealand, but we're pretty proud of how we've done in the northern region. Um, but really, we still are having, you know, around about eight SUDI a year here in counties Manukau, between eight and ten, and that's, that's eight to ten babies too many. Okay, and recently the government have announced they've got five million a year to spend on SUDI interventions and, uh, and they want to get the rate down to 0.1 per thousand by 2025. And we think that we can do this if we're strategic, we are um, very targeted and uh, we can actually implement uh, the strategies that we have now in place. So, uh, about SUDI, sudden unexpected death in infancy. Um, we know th that this model um, holds pretty true. Basically, this happens to babies, in their, especially in the first few months of life. We know there's that critical developmental period that, in which it occurs. We know when it happens that it happens to vulnerable infants. So this is babies where mum has smoked in pregnancy, and this is by far the biggest risk factor for babies in New Zealand now. But it also might happen because they're born prematurely or born small. Um, and what happens is you put these babies in a critical developmental period with a vulnerability in an unsafe or stressful sleep environment, and unfortunately the outcome is often, a, or often or sometimes a SIDS or a SUDI. This is uh, really the major hypothesis for what's going on in SUDI, and uh, Ed and I put this together in a paper um, that's about to be published. It really, um, I think, helps to illustrate where we should be aiming our, uh, or targeting interventions at. Um, Obviously, SUDI happens almost always in sleep, and these are the sorts of things that can cause that stressful sleep situation. 
But most babies actually will respond to that. So if they've not got those vulnerabilities, they'll actually respond and they'll arouse and they'll recover. But actually, if they have vulnerabilities, such as in that failure of arousal here, um, then actually they don't respond like they should. They get bradycard up, they have ineffective gasping, and they fail to also auto-resuscitate. So it really, this sort of gives me a really good framework to say either we have to intervene here or we have to intervene here, and if we've got this one going on, then we really, really have to intervene here. Okay? Really quite basic, I think, once you lay it out like that. Now, um, Ed and team have recently completed the SUDI nationwide study, and this gives really good support for intervening to create safe sleep environments. This is really demonstrating the interaction between smoking and bed sharing. So this is the odds ratio. Uh, bed sharing but not smoking, 1.59. Mum smoked in pregnancy but not bed sharing, 1.91. But if you get both of these situations together, that's that sleep situation plus a vulnerable baby, you get an extremely high odds ratio, okay? And that's where we need to be hitting at in New Zealand as far as making a difference. Right, so this is uh, what we have as far as all the adjusted odds ratios, basically, um, or, or odds ratios for SUDI risk factors, and this has been built from five large international case control studies. So we've got lots and lots and lots of information now. So Ed took this and made it into their app. It has an algorithm that sits behind it. We've made it into this web form that sits in primary care. So this is something that we can bring up at the six week check. And it gives a result, okay? So it gives some information at the end of it. Um, and that's what we have started to pilot in primary care. So, and we also, sorry, we've also at the top there got a tab to the health pathway, so we've got all the information there for primary care to use if they need to get some support for that family. Okay, so what am I about? I'm about doing a co-design project. And co-design is about people-centred design. It's where the experience, knowledge and creativity of families and healthcare workers is an essential part of the design. It offers the opportunity to uncover real barriers and to accelerate uh, as an accelerant of progress. And I really liked that description of co-design. It really it does describe what we're trying to do. So this gives a nice example of a co-design methodology. So basically, we have all this data. We've, created, we've got an algorithm that was created by Bob Carpenter over in the UK and adapted by Ed into the Safe Sleep Calculator. And we have the cap primary care capabilities. It's a time period in which we can actually intervene in primary care at the six week check. So we've got that touch point. Um, we have a safe sleep calculator prototype, but we really need to test it in this environment to actually check that it's right, you know, it's the right thing to do. Is it having the right effect? Okay, so these are the parts of the project. It's really a qualitative um, project. Um, and We'll be measuring effectiveness and then co-design checking. But we're also using the safe sleep calculator data set analysis. Um, we've got ethics approval and so forth, and we've got the interviews underway. Um, really, the, safe, the progress so far is the safe sleep calculator begins a conversation. I really like this one. To be honest, I didn't even think about it before the form came out. I did not have a particular way of talking about it. People asked me about it if they were worried, but it was not part of what we did at that check. So this is a comment from a nurse in primary care. And this is, I think, shows the advantages of having a sort of systematic way of doing these things. Um, the result may be alarming or frightening and um, nurses were saying that they were better able to manage difficult conversations. They also appreciated the Safe Sleep Calculator limited the information that they needed to give to the most essential information at that time. Uh, and these are the initial results. This is from the first 470 or so Safe Sleep Calculations that have happened in primary care. So in behind this tool, it accumulates a data set. And the red line is the total risk, the blue line is the non-modifiable risk. So at six weeks, you can't modify things like your birth weight. Um, and the blue box really illustrates the group, I think, that we should be targeting, and that would be the risk level of 0.4 per thousand or more. The, back up, the backing up this, um, Ed and John Thompson have applied this to the New Zealand case control study. The cases had a median of 8.4 per thousand risk. Their controls were 0.6 per thousand, but it actually, if I ran it against our current safe sleep calculations, ours are 0.1 per thousand. So it looks like a pretty good way of predicting um, cases. 
Okay, so 90% of the cases would have had been predicted with a risk score of 0.4 per thousand. Thank you.